there are many forms of meditation that are in vogue these days. You see advertisements for them in various magazines and in social media networks of men and women sitting comfortably in the lotus position in seeming tranquility. For some reason, there always seems to be a blue sky or a bright sun shining above them. This would hint at a hard sale going on, trying to get people to believe that this is the way to inner peace and wholeness. If only it was as easy as that, as sitting in a lotus position and watching a bright sky. There is a danger that those advertisements are selling to us cheap grace. And the gospel warns us against cheap grace. That if the human heart wants wholeness, there is a price to be paid. To receive the pearl of great price, the Lord tells us, we have to give up everything else. Without paying that price, then there's a danger that we are just interested in some kind of vague religious mysticism that will give us a good feeling rather than approaching the real source of human wholeness. There's a danger that we are running away from reality rather than going towards the deepest and very ground of reality. There is nothing more dangerous than religion that is running away from reality. It can turn into simply an ego massage. The Christian contemplative life was described by St. Bruno, the founder of the Carthusian order, who was a true contemplative in the Western sense, as observing a busy leisure and resting in quiet activity. Busy leisure and quiet activity. Two almost contradictory elements that Bruno is trying to hold in tension, activity and rest, implying that in the silence and in the inactivity of contemplation and meditation, the hardest work that the human being can do is going on. We have said previously that at the center of car discalced Carmelite spirituality is the Christ who dwells in our innermost mansion. The journey to that innermost room of who you are cannot be done when we do not face the reality of who we actually are. And facing up to that reality is always the hardest and most difficult thing any one of us can do. We are frightened of it, intimidated by it, and so easily put off. The Lord warned us, and it is absolutely true, there is a high price to go to the human heart and to rest in that human heart. Many modern people believe that psychology began with Freud and Jung. They could not be more wrong. Psychological assessment has been part of the Western contemplative tradition going back to the first monks in the fourth century. In Teresa of Avila's literary works, a high value is put on self-knowledge as the very first and fundamental step in the spiritual life. And that self-knowledge must accompany every subsequent step to avoid the risk of just entering into self-delusion. She is adamant of its significance and repeats it many times. However high a state the soul may have attained, self-knowledge is incumbent upon it. 
and this it will never be able to neglect, even should it so desire. Self-knowledge is so important that even if you were raised right up to heaven, I should like you never to relax the cultivation of it. In another place, she writes, I think it is a greater favour if the Lord sends us a single day of humble self-knowledge, even at the cost of many afflictions and trials, than many days of prayer. She warns even those reaching for the highest aspects of the spiritual life, however sublime your contemplation may be. Take care both to begin and to end every period of prayer with self-examination. For 20 years, Teresa wandered in a wilderness of failure. Knowing how much she owed to God in her life as a nun, and feeling to the top how far she fell short of that mark. Her early life is one long cry of anguish. It was only when she came to the first inklings of self-knowledge that life started to change. Without self-knowledge, life Prayer, meditation, contemplation remain permanently paralyzed. Have you ever noticed how often times you flinch when you look in a mirror? There's something in us and in that flinching that tells us there's something that we really do not like. Something is putting us off. Something is frightening us. It is never, I think, the immediate face that is looking back at us. It's not just the skin deep impression. There's something behind it. Something deeper. Something coming from a very profound place that we are disturbed by. When Teresa came to self-knowledge, nothing that would present itself in a mirror would make her flinch. She was explicit about what she saw in the mirror what she saw looking back at her. She describes herself as a worm or as a weak woman. It's almost jarring the words. But in the mirror of self-knowledge, she saw her own reality her own baseness and her own at times foulness but she did not run away because the mirror that she was looking into was a particular mirror it was the mirror of a loving God who had a plan for her life and a thought about who she was and who she is and the reality of what she was living was so far away from it. White looks even whiter when we set it beside the black. And black looks even blacker when we set it against the white. There's more to this mirror than simply glass. It is the God who knows us and the God who loves us. St. John of the Cross was a co-worker of St. Teresa's in the reform of the Carmelite order. And he furthered 
her self-examination and her coming to self-knowledge. He believed that he had identified the source of our flinching when it comes to mirror image. He believes it is our desiring or more our craving that causes us to flinch so often. He was emphatic. Everything that God created, whether people, creatures or nature, is true, good and beautiful. It is a blessing to us from God. They are, these beautiful things, in no sense a problem. A problem comes, however, whenever the human heart, the human will, our desiring interacts with those good, true, beautiful things that God has created. Ever so quickly, we give our hearts to these things without us even knowing that we're doing it. We want them. We even crave them. This might seem like a little thing, but for John it is not. When we set our hearts on these objects, they hold sway over us. They occupy our attention. They take first place. When they hold these positions of power, there is no room for anything else. Especially if that something else or someone else is the infinity and the majesty of God. John says that the person has only one will and if it gets caught up in a particular thing, it will not be free, complete, single or pure. Yet that is what is needed if God is to transform it. John argues that as soon as God is displaced in the human heart, we immediately start doing violence to ourselves. John has a very interesting and modern take on human nature. John sees that when people's hearts get wrapped up in jobs and plans and relationships, they do admittedly at first get a new zest for life and a new thrill. Before we know quite when or how it started, that job, plan or relationship starts to make serious de demands on us rather than we on it. It becomes like the chick in the nest. The more it is fed, the more it demands. The more it demands attention, the more it demands feeding. And we have to give more and more of ourselves in order to satisfy it and to sustain it. The job, the plan, the relationship seems to want our whole focus to be placed right there at its own disposal. Out of nowhere, our vision of life starts to shrink down to the size and the shape of that job, plan or relationship. And we are left with tunnel vision. It makes us think that we cannot see past the object that is sitting right at the end of our nose. All of a sudden, we find excuses and rationalizations falling from our lips, trying to salve our conscience and explaining to others, this is just what I have to do. Others do it. It's very normal. Don't worry about it. 
as the job, the plan, or the relationship takes more and more of our time and our effort and our energy and our sales, we get the uncomfortable feeling that something is wrapping itself too strongly around us. The job, the plan, the relationship has somehow grown coils that are holding us. All kinds of good and worthy things are jettisoned and sacrificed for its sake until at last we are prepared to make the final sacrifice for this job, plan or relationship. We sacrifice to it our dignity, integrity and our own self-worth in order to have it and to keep it living and thriving in us. At this stage, and probably a lot earlier, we have got the sense that something has gone wrong. But that we have gone so far down this road that we can't turn back now. We have no option. We have to go with this all the way. Change is out of the question. When John asks us to look at this carefully in the mirror, he asks us to see it for what it is. He asks us to see who is it that is really in charge, that the object has taken more and more, and that we are in slavery to it. So often, we have said to ourselves and to others that we love that job, that plan, that relationship. But love in that sense is always the wrong word. Love is the furthest thing from what we are talking about. It's not love, it's addiction. We have somehow convinced ourselves that addiction is something that happens to other people, to people over there, to people in that place, not us. We associate addiction with substances and pastimes of various sorts, but that is not to see the whole picture. When we love, love makes life free, beautiful and great. When we are addicted to something, addiction makes our lives imprisoned, ugly and small, the very opposite. Addiction is the gauntlet we all have to run. It is the gauntlet we have to run because we do not love as our hearts were made to love. Addiction is a caricature, a mirror image that we have settled for far too often. And John gives us a sniff test in order to sniff out the oncoming of addiction. The object starts to fatigue us, it causes us anxiety, it causes us confusion. We get a sense of guilt and we get the real conviction that we are helpless to do anything about it. John shows us what we are in the mirror, an addict, an addict to all kinds of things. Father Ian Matthew, a discussed Carmelite friar, in his book, The Impact of God, talks about the long-term effect of addiction. He likens addiction to tourism. Tourism, he says, is an extraordinary blessing in lives. It can freshen up lives very well. It puts people into a new surrounding, a different climate. It means a change of cuisine, and you can meet the most extraordinary different people. The tourist also has a vast field of freedom in front of them 
to taste and to touch to meet and to try new things. It enlivens a person for the return to the normal, for the run of the mill kind of things. But Father Ian wants us to realise that tourism is good for a short break. Just imagine, he says, what it'd be like to be a permanent tourist. How sad a life that would be. It would be never unpack, pa unpacking one's suitcase, never really understanding the meaning of being home. It would entail us having plenty of acquaintances, but no real friendships. Many, many instantaneous sensations, but literally no interior. And behind it all would be the ache of what might have been and wishing that you'd stayed longer. The frenetic pace of modern life, the keeping on the move all the time, gives us away. We're running away from the reality of living superficial addiction. So many of us are living as tourists in our own lives rather than residents in the life that God has given us. Let us return to that mirror again. Let me encourage you to look into the mirror. For looking into that mirror will have far reaching and unforeseen consequences for, for your life. St. Frieza of Avila and St. John of the Cross encourage you to look there in order to know yourself. They are asking you to try to rub away all the cosmetics that you have used to build up a false self-image, a mask, that have covered the negative effects of addiction on your life. They want you to search for the truth of who you really are, what that image presents. Trees of Avila, John of the Cross, don't beat about the bush. They warn us that the first time we can look into that mirror, it can be shocking. But they say, do not flinch. Do not be cowed. Do not run away. In seeing yourself, you will recognize reality. You will know who you are. And in knowing who you are, you will, are already reaching for humility. Humility sometimes breeds a negative conception of a nasty, greasy, cringing humility. The humility of Uriah Heep. But humility is something completely simple. Humility is knowing the truth of who we are having the courage to stand in that truth and to be able to acknowledge that in the great scheme of things, I am nothing. But that very acknowledgement of nothingness 
is everything. For we, in the moment of truth, stand like a child with our hands raised above us, asking for help, asking for assistance. And what parent could abandon its child in its hour of need? Certainly not our Father in heaven. Not the Father who is full of abundance and majesty. He knows our addiction. He knows our truth. But that simply draws out of God what is even better about him. And this is what the Carmelite saints are encouraging us towards. In the, that in the recognition of our own reality, of our own nothingness, we come to know the infinite love and longing and desiring of the God who made us. To give ourselves to him completely. To let his majesty, his joy, his beauty, his life come and fill up our emptiness and nothingness and failure and addiction. For he is love and longs for nothing else to give himself to us. Therese of the Child Jesus spoke for the whole tradition when she came up with those wonderful words. Yes, I feel it, even though I had on my conscience all the sins that can be committed, I would go my heart broken with sorrow and throw myself into, the, into Jesus' arms, for I know how much he loves the prodigal child who returns to him. The courage and the inspiration that comes in looking into the mirror comes not from ourselves, but from the God who comes to us through that mirror. That's the good news that Carmelites want to preach to us, the type of God that we have. All the time, Jesus has been looking at us. He has never taken his eye away from us. He has seen our reflection and knows our truth and knows our addiction and knows exactly what is reflected in the mirror. Yet still, after all, he is not repulsed by it. He loves us. And in fact, in that place of truth, he loves us even more if that is possible. He loves us enough to die for us. For in the place of weakness and brokenness and addiction and failure, Christ plants his cross. In the deepest darkness, Christ hammers his cross firmly into that ground and is going nowhere. He is there for us. Humility simply asks of us that we go to God in all our truth, in confidence and in love. 